Hi everybody, welcome to BCA 1 Chapter 6. I am your guest lecturer, Mr. Albertus Bredekamp. I am from the Department of Electrical, Electronic and Computer Engineering at CPUT. So let's jump right in and have a look at this section. So we're taking a look at data communication, delivering information anywhere and anytime. So our learning objectives here are to describe the major applications of a data communication system, explain the major components of a data communication system, describe the major types of processing configurations, explain the three types of networks and describe the main network topologies. It is also important that we explain the networking concepts such as bandwidth, routing, routers and the client-server model. We need to describe wireless and mobile technologies and networks, discuss the importance of wireless security and the techniques used, and summarize the convergence phenomena and its applications for business and personal use. Data communication is the electronic transfer of data from one location to another. It enables an information system to deliver information, improves the flexibility of data collection and transmission, and is the basis of virtual organizations. It provides e-collaboration. So if you can think about the way that the COVID-19 crisis has changed the way we do business, a lot more people are using virtual meetings and virtual telecommunications uh, setups to make it look or seem as though a team is collaborating in one place even though they're physically se separated from one another. So why do managers need to know about data communication? It enhances decision makers efficiency and effectiveness and enables organizations to use email and electronic file transfer to improve efficiency and productivity. What are the effects of data communication technologies? Well, you can get online training for employees and this can be provided via virtual classrooms. Internet searches for information keep employees up to date. Who hasn't Googled something when they don't know? We're not expected to know everything that is in a book, just the basics so that when we need the details, we can look it up. The internet and data communication systems facilitate lifelong learning. The boundaries between work and personal life are less clear-cut as data communication is more available in both homes and businesses. It's easier to stay connected now than ever and some people can find it stressful that they don't really can ever disconnect from work even though they're home. However, web and video conferencing are a lot easier, especially if you're an executive and in the past you would have had to travel a lot, where now it's a lot easier, a lot cheaper and a lot safer to have a video conference instead via something like Zoom or Teams. Let's take a look at the term bandwidth. This is the amount of data that can be transferred from one point to another in a certain time period. Attenuation is the loss of power in a signal as it travels from the sending device to the receiving device. Now, in general, the greater your bandwidth, the greater the amount of data that you can send in one second. So, for example, if you want to transmit 1 megabits per second, you would use a certain amount of bandwidth. If you want to transmit 2 megabits per second, you will need twice the amount of bandwidth. So the more data you transmit, the faster you transmit, the more bandwidth you need. Attenuation is the signal getting weaker and weaker as it travels. This is called attenuation. So if you and your friend are standing on opposite hills, you're far apart. So because of the distance, there's a lot of attenuation 
between you and your friend. So you have to shout very loudly so that your friend can still hear you even with all the attenuation, even with all the signal loss in between the two hills. Broadband, what is that all about? Multiple pieces of data are sent simultaneously to increase the transmission rate. So just to give you an idea quickly of the relationship between bandwidth and broadband, let me just make you a simple sketch and we're going to say alright here we have frequency and here we have amplitude so let's just label them amplitude now I'm going to try and keep this very simple so let's say you want to transmit data at 1 megabit per second so there is the amount of bandwidth used to transmit 1 megabit per second of data. If you want to transmit 2 megabits of data, you will need twice the amount of bandwidth. And now you can transmit 2 megabits per second. Now let's say for example that this data here belongs to user A. Now there's still a lot of space over here. There's a lot of space over here. So what if we could add other people to this channel and say well there's the data for one person there's the data for another person there's the data for another person and so on and we can say that okay well uh, let's fill each one of these like so and we can say that for example this data belongs to user B this data belongs to user C and this data belongs to user D and each of these users A, B and C you can see are using the same amount of bandwidth they're, so they're all transmitting at 2 megabits per second You'll notice, however, that user D is using a lot more bandwidth. So in this case, user D is probably transmitting at, say, something like 6 megabits per second. Now, the nice thing about these four conversations is that they're all at different frequencies so what I can do is I can take all of these conversations and push them into the same cable and if I can have multiple data streams if I can have multiple users using the same cable at the same time that is called broadband I hope that clears it up. Alright, now remember if you don't understand please ask Mr. Smuts and he will be more than happy to explain it. Narrowband. Voice grade transmission channel capable of transmitting a maximum of 56,000 bits per second so only a limited amount of information can be transferred. So narrowband just indicates that your bandwidth is very little. So if we go back to our drawing, narrow band would be something like 
this. That's narrow band. And because it's narrow band, we can transmit only a small amount of data through that. In this case, a maximum of, re of say, 56 kilobits per second. And this is what is known as a voice grade channel. That's a narrow band signal. The same, we can call this yellow one a wide band signal. Protocols. When two diplomats of two countries meet, there's a certain number of steps that they go through in order to greet each other and negotiate a treaty and finish a treaty and apply a treaty. The steps that they go through, the sequence of events when two parties meet, the, those are called protocols. So protocol controls how a conversation or how a meeting takes place. So for example, when they open Parliament, certain things happen in a certain order, certain ministers and politicians speak in a certain order for a certain amount of time that is a protocol that controls who does what and when and for how long it is the rules that govern data communication it also uh, relates to things like error detection how do I detect errors how long are the messages going to be and how fast am I going to transmit? Input output devices or thin clients, they used only for sending or receiving information. They have no real processing power. So an input output device is something like the uh, till at your local supermarket. It can only really do one thing. It doesn't have any processing power and it's only used really for sending and receiving information. Sending a barcode to a server and the server returns the price of the item. A smart terminal performs certain processing tasks but it's not a full featured computer. An intelligent terminal, workstation or personal computer performs certain processing tasks without the server computer's support. A netbook computer is a low-cost, diskless computer used to connect to the internet or a LAN. It runs software off servers and saves data to servers. So it's got no local storage and is therefore dependent on a high-speed, high-quality data network to operate. Mini computers, mainframes and supercomputers process data and send it to other devices. They receive data that has been processed elsewhere, process it again and then transmit it to other devices. Smartphones, mobile phones, MP3 players and PDAs, those are other types of data sending and receiving devices. They have advanced capabilities these days with built-in keyboards and external USB support. Video game consoles receive instructions from a game player and produces a video display signal on a television screen or monitor. Modems. Modems are devices that connect a user to the internet. It is short for modulator, demodulator. It is not required for all internet connections. Dial-up is a way in which we used to connect to the internet many years ago. Uh, not really used anymore, very, very rarely. Uh, Dialog is when you use an analog modem to connect your digital computer to the analog 
telephone system. An analog modem is necessary to convert a computer's digital signals to analog signals. Digital subscriber line is a high-speed service that uses ordinary phone lines. It is always on. You don't have to dial anything. You just use it. Cable modems, not really something you're going to find in South Africa, very popular overseas. You have a cable that brings in your television signal and they have found that, well, we can piggyback some data onto there and then you use a cable modem. It uses the same cable that connects to TVs for internet connections. Communication media connects senders and receiving devices. It can be conducted or radiated. So when you want to communicate with another computer you can either use a cable or you can use a radio signal. That's the two ways of doing it. You can either use a wire which is guided. The signal goes where the wire goes. Or radiated, wireless. The signal goes everywhere. It can be point-to-point -point, so you can have a, a satellite talking directly to a ground station, that's point-to-point, -point, or multi-point. You can have a satellite talking to all the satellite dishes of all the DSTV subscribers in an entire country. Here is a breakdown of the different transmission media. On the right we have radiated media or wireless. This can be either radio frequency signals or light. Light is very limited in that um, we're only using the infrared part here for the purpose of this course. Um, infrared is used when you use your remote control with your TV or your DSTV decoder. Um, a, a little fun thing that you can do is you can take the remote control and you can take the camera on your cell phone and you can point the camera at the front of the remote control and you can press the buttons on the remote and you should see the little uh, LED on the remote flash white. You can't see it with the eye because the eye can't see infrared light but you can see it on the camera on the phone because the phone camera can see infrared light and that's one way in which you can test a uh, remote control unit. Radio frequency, lots going on there. You can have broadcasts like TV and radio. Spread spectrum which is a data transmission technique that spreads the radio signal energy across the spectrum. It essentially looks like noise. Very advanced. You can write very thick books on spread spectrum. Have a Google. Have a little bit of a read about spread spectrum. It's quite interesting. It's very very difficult to uh, listen in on spread spectrum. Cellular cellular phones, I think you all know what cellular phones are, microwave, not the one in your kitchen but microwave for telecommunications. Take a look at the towers in your area where you live. What kind of antennas are on there? Where are they pointing? Are they pointing at the sky? Are they pointing at another tower further away? Why would they be pointing at the tower further away and not at the sky? Um, what do you think is being transmitted over there? If you see a dish and a dish pointing at each other, it's usually microwave. If you see a dish pointing at the sky, that's satellite. With conducted media, you have two choices. Electrical conductors and light conductors. Light conductors are fiber optic cables. Um, something fun that you can do with, uh, uh, if you've got a piece of fishing line, Take a piece of fishing line and put one end of the fishing line uh, on a, a flashlight and then look at the other end of the fishing line and you should see the light. The light is being conducted by the fishing line. Electrical conductors, two types, wires, your uh, unshielded twisted pair and your shielded twisted pair. Shielded and unshielded simply means the shielded one is going to be 
able to handle a more noisy electrical environment without data corruption. The sh unshielded twisted pair, you need to put in an electrically quiet environment, otherwise your data will be corrupted. When you have to transmit signals with very high bandwidth, you typically need a coaxial cable. Processing configurations. Data communication systems can be used in several different configurations depending on users' needs, the types of applications they're using and responsiveness of the system. During the past 60 years, three types of process configurations have emerged. Centralized, decentralized and distributed. With centralized processing, all the processing is done at one central computer. It was used in the early days of computer technology. Data processing personnel were in short supply, hardware and software were expensive, so everything was done centrally. The advantage though was you had the ability to exercise tight control on system operations and applications. The disadvantage was a lack of responsiveness to users' needs. With decentralized processing, each user, department or division has its own computer for performing processing tasks, advantages being that it is responsive to users needs, disadvantages being that there is lack of coordination among organizational units and you have a high cost of having many systems. So you have these anthills, if you can imagine, springing up. You've got engineering department have their own computer, mechanical have uh, their own computer, uh, design have their own computer, business have their own computer and these computers don't talk to each other. So if somebody from mechanical needs something from engineering, uh, there's a bit of a problem because these machines do not uh, interface with one another. So there's lack of coordination. And you've got duplication. Uh, you are a student and you happen to be using or, 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 or doing a course in mechanical and one in engineering. Now your information is in two places. Duplication is a problem. Distributed processing maintains centralized control and decentralized operations. Some advantages include accessing unused processing power and computer power can be added or removed. Distance and location are not limiting and it's more compatible with growth. So your control is centralized, but your actual processing is done on many, many different machines all over the place, even on the Internet. Your fault tolerance is improved because if one computer fails, it doesn't take the whole system with it and resources can be shared to reduce costs. The disadvantages are that you need more security and you've got privacy challenges and you can have incompatibility between various pieces of equipment. Managing the network is challenging because it's bigger and more distributed now. Let's take a look at the open systems interconnection model. Now before I start, remember this is just a model. No actual system will implement this model exactly. It is just a way for researchers and engineers to design systems. There are seven layers. The seven layer architecture is used for defining how data is transmitted from computer to computer in a network. It standardizes interactions between network computers exchanging information. The layers in the architecture, the application layer, which is right at the top, serves as the window through which applications access network services. The presentation layer formats messages into packets. The session layer establishes a communication session between two computers. The transport layer generates the receiver's address and ensures the integrity of messages. The network routes the messages. The data link layer oversees the establishment and control of the communication link and the physical layer defines the physical medium used for communication. For your computer to interface to a network, it needs a network interface card, which is the hardware component that enables a computer to communicate over a network. It is known as an adapter card. 
It operates at the OSI model's physical and data link layers. A local area network connects workstations and peripheral devices that are in close proximity, typically inside a classroom or inside a building. A wide area network spans several cities, states or countries and is owned by different parties. I always like to tell my students that the LAN is that part of the network that you own. So all the equipment that is yours, that's your LAN. The moment you have to interconnect to somebody else's network where somebody else owns the other equipment, now you're talking a WAN, a wide area network. A metropolitan area network is designed to handle data communication for multiple organizations in a city and nearby cities as well. So here we have a simple local area network with three workstations, a hub and a server. This is also connected to the internet. Now you'll notice that the hub is the center and I have cables radiating out from that hub. So if you can imagine you hold out your hand, your palm would be the hub and your fingers would be the wires coming out of that hub and you can put a computer on each one of your fingers. That is also known as a star topology because it looks a bit like a star, doesn't it? A wide area network much more complicated. Here I have multiple networks connected or multiple devices connected by multiple point-to-point -point links. Much, much bigger. A metropolitan area network. Now look at these globules. All right, I've got a wide area network here and I've got another metropolitan area network here and I've got single point-to-point -point connections that connect these globules together to local area networks. Network topologies represent a network's physical layout, including the arrangement of computers and cables. Some common topologies include star, the one I just spoke about, ring and bus, and hierarchical and mesh. The star topology consists of a central computer and a series of nodes. The advantages being that cable layouts are easy to modify, you have centralized control, making it easier to detect problems, and nodes can be added to the network easily. It is effective at handling short bursts of traffic. The star topology's disadvantages, if the central host fails, the entire network becomes inoperable. It increases cost as many cables are required. The ring topology, no host computer is required, each computer manages its own connectivity. Each node is connected to two other nodes, upstream and downstream neighbors. So imagine you're a computer. Your left arm is connected to your friend and your right arm is connected to your friend, your other friend. So you are connected to two other nodes, one on the left and one on the right. But transmission is in one direction, say always from left to right or anti-clockwise. It needs less cable than the star topology, but diagnosing problems and modifying the network is a bit more difficult. The bus topology connects nodes along a network segment. It, the ends of the cable are not connected. A terminator is a hardware device used at each end of the cable to absorb the signal. Advantages being that it's easy to extend and reliable. And the wiring layout is simple and uses the least amount of cable of any topology and it keeps the costs down. It is best for handling steady traffic. The disadvantages being that fault diagnosis is difficult and the bus cable can be a bottleneck when network traffic is heavy. A hierarchical topology combines computers with different processing strengths in different organizational levels. It is used by traditional mainframe networks. The mainframe computer is at the top, the front end processes are at the second level, 
Controllers and multiplexes are at the third level. The controller, hardware and software device, it controls data transfer from a computer to a peripheral device. And the multiplexer is a hardware device that allows several nodes to share one communication channel. Terminals and workstations are at the bottom level. Now people, you can just check with Mr. Smuts. The hierarchical topology, if it was up to me, I would not ask in a test or an exam because this is by my opinion obsolete but just know that such a system can exist all right you might want to do a Google to just see a picture of what a hierarchical topology look like but I would concentrate on bus star and ring because those are the primary ones that you will see in the world out there the mesh topology is how the internet is made up. The internet is a network of network. It uses a mesh. Every node is connected to every other node. A node being a computer or a router. It is known as plex or interconnected. The advantages being that it's highly reliable. The disadvantages being that it is expensive and difficult to maintain and expand. So let's take a little bit of a break here and I will talk to you about the major networking concepts in part two of this video. Thank you for listening.